Welcome to Passion Church. For more information about Passion Church, please visit us online at www.passionchurch.tv. Now let's join the service already in progress. Yeah, man. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Okay, I got two of you. I said it's good to be in church this morning. Amen. All right. I just want us to always make sure that we take a moment. You say, well, I'm uncomfortable. I'm, how many introverts we got in the room? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, can I raise my hand? Because I, well, some people don't believe I am, but ask Julie the real Steve. I'm pretty introverted. And so um, uh, that, that moment makes me uncomfortable sometimes. But I don't want us to miss the fact that we need that family time, amen? We need each other. So uh, I don't want you to just blow past that. That's an opportunity every Sunday for you to get to know people and for them to get to know you. So last week, um, we started a new series, and uh, I hope you've been chewing on it just a, a little bit and realize that the Lord wants to speak to us, amen? Are y'all awake? Okay, all right, I, man, y'all were with me in Mind Monsters, and now all of a sudden y'all got quiet on me. I need you, I need you, I need you, amen? T touch your neighbor and tell, tell, tell him he needs you right now, all right? Come on now, all right. So, uh, so I know uh, that the, the subject matter of this series doesn't seem to be that awe-inspiring. I mean, we're talking about ladders. Uh, ladders are pretty common. They're every day. Most of you have used them. Um, some of you have used them more than others, but there are ladder lessons that you need to learn. As I said last week, it would seem like it goes without stating. It would seem like we really don't need to talk about ladder lessons that much, except for the fact that we had something happen here a few years ago that got me to to thinking. So, uh, Austin, put that first slide on the screen, if you will. Um, this is, uh, this is the, uh, aftermath of, uh, someone not understanding ladder lessons. All right. So I told you, I wouldn't tell you who did that other than the fact that his name begins with Ann and ends with Drew, Andrew, Pastor Andrew, uh, give him the second one, show him the second one. Uh, th this, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, the second uh, screen you got up there. So he ripped down the whole ceiling from here all the way back to those lights. Uh, we had a ladder set up here and we were trying to adjust the projector and and Andrew being six foot gargantuan, because um, I'm not sure exactly, six five, I don't know, he grows, all, I, I think I'm getting shorter because he just gets, keep, keeps getting taller. He goes up the ladder because I figured it would be easier for him since he's taller than me. And I walk back into this back room and then I hear this big crash and I come out and that is the aftermath. As you also know, it was seven days before Jess and Andrew got married and the, that uh, vent right there fell on him, cut his face all open, dislocated his shoulder, all this kind of stuff. That's why Pastor Andrew's not here today. Last week when I preached, he looked too longingly at the ladder and just grounded him. He's already been grounded, but now he's really grounded. He's actually home with Dax, who's not feeling well. But I'll, I'm, this is my, my, my story. I'm going to stick to it. He's, he's at home because he looked at the ladder too longingly last week, and we said, you can't come back until this is over. All right, so we started talking about ladder lessons and... and um, I told you that the first one, I'm not going to re-preach it, but that we need to learn to cling to be clung, that the ladder has the capability of holding us, but we have to hold on. We're using this metaphorically, if you will, to talk about how our relationship with God works. We must cling to him so that he will cling to us. He has the capacity, the ability to hold on to us. A lot of times we don't hold on to him, so I'm trying to get you to check your hold on so you don't have to check your held on. All right, and so so we're learning these lessons. So I, I want us to go a, a little bit further because my question then is, if we're clinging tight to, to the ladder to God, then what do we do so that we don't fall? So we're going to answer that today. I'm going to teach you a lesson that will help you to to hold on a little bit tighter. So join me, if you will, in First Chronicles chapter 23. We're going to look at an unusual passage of Scripture as it relates to ladders, but if you'll stay with me, we'll get there. First Chronicles chapter 23, beginning in verse 28, down through verse 31. Then we're going to go into the New Testament. So here we are, First Chronicles 23. The duty of the Levites was to help Aaron's descendants in the service of the temple of the Lord to be in charge of the courtyards, the side rooms, the purification of all sacred things, and the performance of other duties at the house of God. 
They were in charge of the bread sat, set out on the table, the special flour for the grain offerings, the thin loaves made without yeast, the baking and the mixing, and all the measurements of quantity and size. Now listen to this. They were also to stand every morning to thank and praise the Lord. They were to do the same in the evening and whenever burnt offerings were presented to the Lord on the Sabbaths, at the new moon feasts, and at the appointed festivals. They were to serve before the Lord regularly in the proper number and in the way prescribed for them. Don't you see the ladder in? Okay, you don't. I'll bring it. I, I, I'm gonna get there. Go to the New Testament. First Peter chapter two. Beginning in verse five, just verse five, listen to what it says. It says, and now you have become building stones for God's use in building his house. What's more, listen to this, listen, listen, this is talking about you. You are his holy priests. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, you a priest. Come on, tell him, you're a priest. That's what he says. What's more, you are his holy priest, so come to him, you who are acceptable to him because of Jesus Christ, and offer to God those things that please him. And then finally, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and verse 25, out of a little bit different version than you probably ever heard it, because some of you already know this passage, you're, re you're about ready to quote it to me, which is, don't forsake the gathering together of yourselves as some... Okay, okay, you know, okay, so listen to this. Let us consider how to inspire each other to greater love and to righteous deeds, not forgetting to gather together as a community, as some have forgotten, but encouraging each other, especially as the day of his return approaches. Okay, so, so this is odd. You're talking about ladders and you're reading this stuff to us and it doesn't seem to have anything to do with ladders. But I, I need you to understand and, and stick with me just a moment because let me just tell you this morning that my goal is not to get you just to climb the ladder. My goal is this. If you just climb the ladder but you can't stay on the ladder, then the gained height, all it does then is it increases the damage to you when you fall. So if I can teach you how to climb the ladder but then once you get up here, you're not able to stay up here. The higher you go, if you don't learn the ladder lessons and you fall, can I tell you from the experience we had with Andrew that and it increases the damage done to you. The problem is, is that Andrew went about as high as I am right now and he fell and it dislocated his shoulder. If Andrew had been way down here and fallen, he would have not been injured probably. Cause, yeah, okay. But uh, are y'all still here? All right. So, so, so my goal is not to get you to climb the ladder. My goal, my assignment is to teach you how to stay there. You say, what is all this ladder stuff? I'm talking about your relationship with the Lord, right? So, 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 so before we dive too deep into the passages, I want you to go back for one moment to Andrew's fall uh, for just a second because his fall reveals a lesson that helps keep us on the ladder. Here's the truth of the situation. The ladder was capable of holding Andrew. The problem was is that he got higher than his ability of the points of contact to keep him balanced enough to stay on the ladder. Okay, so this is, this is literally what happened. Andrew had no problem going up the ladder because he's using points of contact. I can't do it the way he did it because I've got a microphone in my hand. But Andrew literally used four points of contact, both hands, both feet, right? And in his feet, he probably had eight points of contact because his feet probably reached all the way over there and touched that one too, but that's another story. So, so, so anyway, so, so he's up here at the top, right? And we're all good. The dilemma came is that he got to this place where he had to let go with both hands, all right, so now he's reaching above his head with both hands, trying to adjust the projector, and he only has two points of contact. And so now when the weight shifted, whatever happened, we still don't know. All we know is that something shifted and all of the sudden, because he didn't have enough points of contact, he fell. Are y'all with me? Okay, so lesson number three is this. Get this up on, on your notes. I want you to write this down. Lesson number three is this. You are safe when you maintain multiple points of contact. Okay, 
The safety protocol for ladders is that you need to maintain at least three points of contact to be at your safest. So the more points of contact you have, the more likely you are to be able to hold on to the ladder. So let me, let, you, let, me, let me show you how this is illustrated then, spiritually speaking. There are at least three occasions that there's a lot more than that. I just want to point out three. Three really good occasions, encounters in Scripture that illustrate for you, if you will, this concept. For instance, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus tells a parable about a man who builds his house, we would say builds his house on the sand. But there's another man in the, st the account as well. The Bible says that Jesus talks not only about the man who built his house on the sand, he also talks about a man who built his house on the rock. And the Bible says that a storm approached, uh, 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 an obstacle showed up in his life, chaos broke into his life, a need broke into his life, a, a situation took place in his life. And the Bible says that the storm hit his house but there was no problem. In fact, if you really want to read the parable closely, what you discover is Jesus never talks about this guy even getting nervous about the storm. He never became concerned about the storm that was approaching his house. He didn't go to the storm shelter. The siren didn't go off. He didn't freak out. He didn't run to Walmart, buy all the bread and the milk because he recognized that my house has enough foundation, enough points of contact to withstand what's about to hit my life. The, the, the opposite was also true. The man that built his house on the sand experienced devasta devastation and injury and brokenness simply because he didn't have the foundation necessary. Let me put it this way in latter language. He didn't have enough points of contact. The, 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 the second one is this one. You know this story too. It's Peter. The, it, it's the story of his denial. We're, we're talking about Peter, man. This is one of Jesus' inner circle. This is the dude that stands up and rebukes Jesus. You got to be out of your mind or really bold to rebuke Jesus. And Peter stands up and said, though nobody else goes with you, I will follow. He knew the hymn. He sang it. He probably wrote it. I'll go with you when nobody else will go. I will, I will never deny you. I will go to you with your death. The only problem is, is that when Jesus is approaching his death, the Bible says it like this. Peter, rather than, than staying close to Jesus, tight to Jesus, multiple points of contact with Jesus, the Bible describes it like this. It says, he followed from afar. So rather than being right up next to Jesus with multiple points of contact, now distance develops. And when distance develops, the dilemma is this, as distance develops in your relationship, then also your points of contact diminish. And then when he's challenged, he can't withstand the challenge to his faith because of lack of contact. Yeah, I'm preaching right now. So the perfect illustration, perhaps the most perfect illustration in Scripture is the story of Judas. Because here's a dude that gets to go with Jesus everywhere. Think about what Judas has observed. Judas is right there when they see all the miracles. Judas is invited to the prayer meetings. Judas, Judas hears Jesus preach. Judas is, a, is one of the 12. He's right there. He sees it all. He gets to experience it all. And the dilemma is this. He was attached to Jesus, but he wasn't connected to Jesus. I'm preaching right now. And a lot of us are attached and we're not connected. And like Judas, what happens is this. His, he didn't have enough points of contact and so he falls to temptation. I want to submit to you this morning that the problem with many of us is that we, we are experiencing shifts and quakes and, and changing seasons and storms that would not normally, in, in a normal environment, this is, listen, we're not in a normal environment anymore. We may never get back to a normal environment. So we're in this middle of this changing landscape. The seasons are changing. It's like there's an earthquake beneath our feet. But normally, if it was normal, it wouldn't shake us, right? We wouldn't even be bothered by it. But it's not normal. And so now, uh, what wouldn't normally cause us to be injured, what wouldn't normally cause us to be concerned, what normally wouldn't bother us a bit, now, simply because of the fact that we don't have enough points of contact, Instead of, instead of just walking through it like it doesn't even exist, all of a sudden what we're realizing, many of us in this room even, are being shaken. And in some cases, we're even falling. So, so what should just be a small bump in the road? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help you here. What ought to just be a bump in the road? 
What ought to just be a small wave, just a moment of discomfort. Now, because we don't have the necessary points of contact, now it unseats us. And it shakes us to our core. And the end result is this, we become injured. So, so let me say it like this. If we had enough points of contact, then we would blow off the bump that now blows us off. Some of y'all wouldn't be freaking out about the stuff you've been freaking out over the last year and a half. If you'd have had enough points of contact. Oh, okay. That went there and came right back. What is shifting beneath your feet five years ago, you would have handled it with no problem because you had multiple points of contact. But because now you've isolated yourself and because now you've broken points of contact, what you discover is the ground is shifting and you have no ability to hang on because you don't have enough points of contact. That's why I read these strange passages of Scripture to you. The passage that I read to you out of 1 Peter, I read them in the order that they fall, but, uh, but, but, but maybe I need to back up and do it like this. In 1 Peter chapter 2, the, the word declares, and I had you say it to one another, your priest, the word declares that because of what Jesus has done, because he came, the Old Testament system of priests was, was done away with in that now because of the relationship that Jesus has allowed us to establish with the Father through him, we are now priests. You don't wear the collar, you know, thankfully, because we would think you were weird. I didn't know how to dress yourself. But the truth is, you're priests. The re- so, so therefore, if, if we have now become priests because of what Jesus has done for us, right? then we too are now also responsible to carry out the duties of the priests that we've become. Are you with me? So now let me back up. First Peter says you're a priest. I read to you out of First Chronicles because First Chronicles chronicles for us the duties of the priest. Right? So, so, so let me go back. Let me go back. I'll come to Hebrews here in a minute. But it is our responsibility now to do what the priest did. Listen to what it says. It chronicles for us. It says this. They were to stand every morning to thank and praise the Lord. They were supposed to do the same in the evening. And whenever burnt offerings were presented to the Lord on Sabbaths, at the new moon feasts, and at the appointed festivals. Everybody got it? Okay, again, they were to stand every morning and every more evening to give thanks. They were, then on the Sabbath, they were supposed to make sacrifice. Every morning, every evening, and on the Sabbath. Every morning, every evening, and on the Sabbath. I don't know what that sounds like to you, but to me that sounds like this. Multiple points of contact. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we've missed the latter lesson and it's causing many of us to fall during the storms of life and become unstable simply because as priests, we have a mandate on us. As priests, we should have multiple points of contact every day and then listen to this, and then on Sunday. Okay. In other words, this is teaching us this, that Sunday contact with God. I hope every Sunday when you walk in here, you encounter the living God. That's one of, that is our vision statement, that you would encounter God. So, 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 so I'm praying that every time you walk in here, you encounter God. That on Sunday mornings, you have a Holy Spirit encounter. That, that, that you don't just walk in here and hear, hear self-help messages and just sing a few songs and smile at a few people and wave as you go to your lunch. No, I'm praying that as you encounter, as you pull up, even before you get here, that the only thing that's happening happening is when you pull into the parking lot, we experience and encounter a loving, living Jesus that cares for us. I pray that's the truth, but may, would you please listen to me this morning? Although what we do here is essential, it's not enough. Okay. Sunday is an inadequate number of contact points to sustain us and to stabilize us. 
In order to fulfill our calling as priests, there should be multiple points of contact daily and weekly. Let me be very blunt this morning. The reason that some of you are faltering, the reason that some of you are failing, the reason that some of you are struggling at the level you're struggling at is simply this. You only have one contact point and it takes place on Sunday. The truth of the matter is this for many of you, is that you never read the word except on Sunday and then only what's on the screen. That's an inadequate number of contact points. Some of you never actually pray for yourself. You only pray in here on Sunday morning when somebody's leading you on a microphone and then you wonder why when your world starts falling apart, you don't have the ability to sustain and withstand. It's simply because you don't have enough contact points. The result is is this. Many of us are on a spiritual starvation diet. Could you, I ain't going to answer this question for some of you, because could you actually go all week without eating but one time? What if I told you the only time you can eat this week is today? You better eat everything you want to eat the rest of the week today, because this is going to have to be sufficient for you the rest of the week. Some of you could withstand that. Most of you could not, because none of us like to fast anymore. <clears throat> Selah. Okay, so, uh, so, 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 if we cannot withstand that physically. Why do we operate on a spiritual starvation diet in our relationship with God? So so, so can I remind you then that David understood practical multiple points of contact. He practiced multiple points of contact. Psalm chapter 55, verse 7, listen to what he says. Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud. And he shall hear my voice. You missed it. Evening, morning, and noon. We also know that Jesus practiced multiple points of contact. The Bible says that it it was his common practice. You don't call something a common practice unless it's a common practice. I do it more than once. I do it all the time to the degree that people begin to notice I do it and they write about it because they've seen me do it so often. And Jesus would pull away from everybody in points of contact with the Father. Let me just submit to you that if Jesus, the Son of the living God, God in flesh, God of the universe, the God that holds all power, authority, dominion, if he himself had to practice multiple points of contact to maintain his relationship and to have the power that he needed to survive in this on this planet, then I would submit to you that maybe, just maybe, we ought to do the same. Listen, I I just need to help you this morning. I just need you to know this is a fact about me. I live for Sundays. Sunday is my favorite day of the week. My whole life revolves around Sunday. Uh, But I want you to hear me clearly. Sunday isn't enough. Can I tell you this morning, if you you only have a Sunday point of contact, then can I tell you that what's going to happen is if you only have a Sunday point of contact, you are Andrew on the ladder. You will fall because it's not sufficient. It's not enough. According to scripture, as a priest, you are mandated every morning, every night, and on Sunday. In fact, as a priest, it's almost like the Sunday is an afterthought. What you do in the morning and what you do at night should culminate in what we do in here on Sundays. The reason that we have to pump you and prime you and work you to get you going is probably because you didn't have a morning and a noon and a night contact point. So we're operating with people that only have one point of contact. It's the crazy folks that contact him in the morning and realize they can't make it past noon without talking to him again and then they contact him before they go to bed it's those kind of folks that walk in here on Sunday morning and they go lo and behold I'm ready to worship because I've been contacting him all week long yeah 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 that's why that's why that's why the Hebrew writer said it like this through Jesus therefore let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise this what we do in here on Sunday doesn't end on Sunday it starts on Sunday and it carries, okay. That's why the writer of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 says this, pray without ceasing. It's this idea of constant interaction and contact with the relationship that you have to have to sustain your ability to stay attached and connected to the ladder. I'm preaching, right? I know this is basic stuff, but I just keep seeing people fall. 
and they're falling when they shouldn't because it's not even that bad of a storm, but they're falling. Come on now. We got people that have fallen off the ladder because there was a virus. At the same time, we got people in China that are not falling when they're being beheaded. What's the difference? They are attached and connected to God like their life depends on it. And we just added him to everything else. We Okay. And because we don't have the contacts, we're not connected. The writer of Hebrews says, the, the, the passage that I read to you, he says, um, it, it's the passage that you could probably quote, is that there's, a, there's this aspect of, uh, another aspect of developing these points of contact. Uh, the, and he says it like this, don't forsake the gathering together. Uh, that's not the version I read to you, but it's this idea of the assembling. And I know you've heard this and I have preached this. In fact, I'm preaching it right now. That we should not forsake worship together, Right? So, so, this is, so it's not like Sunday is not essential. But, 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 but maybe in our preaching. Because uh, like it or not, preachers can be self-serving too. We need you here on Sundays because it would be really lonely here preaching without you. I've tried that and it's not very fun. All right. So, 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 so I know we've preached that because, but maybe we've limited it. Could I, could I take a little liberty this morning? I, I think maybe he is talking about worship service like this, but maybe, maybe, just maybe, we've limited the interaction that he's calling us to. Could it, could it be that, that, that this means you should show up on a regular basis? You should show up on a regular basis. In fact, let me just, uh, on a side note, just remind you that it said the priest showed up on the Sabbath. Okay, so you have a mandate on your life to be here on Sunday. Okay, don't, don't miss. My mouth is moving. Hear what I'm saying. You have a mandate as a priest to be here on Sundays, all right? I'm not giving you liberty to say this is not essential. This is essential. But maybe, just maybe, what he's really doing is this. Uh, maybe, maybe I think the writer's also saying that in order for us to be able to spur one another on, because he says spur one another on, then he gives us some, a, a time frame. He says, do this as the day of the Lord approaches, Anybody in here want to have an argument real quick about whether it's almost time for Jesus to come back? Come on now. Come on now. We've got everything in place. It's rapidly. If he, was, if he was about to come when I was 14, lo and behold, I'm telling you now, at 53, he's closer than he's ever been. All right? We're, we're approaching the day, and the writer says that we're to spur one another on. And so I, I, I just think that maybe in order for us to be able to spur one another on and to be able to withstand the storms that are approaching as Jesus is approaching in his return, because y'all do know, well, I'm going to mess up somebody right now. You do know that as, G as it gets closer to the time that Jesus is going to come back, it's not going to get better. Read your Bible. Some of y'all, like, y'all think it's going to get, like, really great before Jesus comes back. Read your Bible. They're going to hate us more. <laughs> I can get no help. Because y'all just, when we want everybody to love us and accept us in culture and just like make room for us and let us be the, the star of the show. I'm telling you, read your Bible. They're coming for us. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, hey, we're not going to sing, hold the fort till Jesus come and hide in here from them. We just need to be aware that it's going to get worse before it gets better, right? And so, but, but, but as the day approaches, it will get worse. So we need to spur one another on. There will be storms that we've never experienced before that could be more shaking and more vicious than we've ever experienced before. May, maybe what the Hebrew writer is telling us is not only is it important not to ignore the Sabbath and for, not to forsake the gathering together of the saints on the Sabbath, but may I submit to you that we cannot crunch all of that necessary, here it is, community into one hour. So what we're going to do is we're going we're to lengthen our services to four hours. I'm making an announcement today. From now on, we're going to start at nine or at uh, whatever, 10, and we're going to three. Okay, y'all wouldn't stay for that. Neither would I. All right? I don't want that. You can't do in one hour what needs to be done. I think maybe that the Hebrew writer is trying to teach us that we need multiple points of contact to the body of Christ, multiple points of contact to community. Have you ever, oh, okay. Have you ever wondered 
why it is that some people are in this body seem to have numerous people who will rally to them in their time of need. Have you ever wondered? I mean, you're, you're, here you are, you're sitting here this morning on a Sunday morning and you're hurting and you're struggling and you're literally fighting for your life and it seems like no one even notices. Could it be that the person who everybody rallies around has worked hard and intentionally to develop and maintain multiple points of contact with the body so that the body now knows and responds. Because here's the truth. The truth is, is some of you in this room think that nobody cares. The truth is, nobody knows. Because you're only here on Sunday morning and you put your church smile on. And when we ask you how you were doing, you said, I'm blessed when you're really broken. But because you don't have multiple points of contact, like through circles and like through serving on ministry teams where people really get to know who you are and really know what's going on in your life outside of Sunday morning, then you get shaken and you fall because you don't have the necessary community. We had a young lady that used to attend the church here years ago, came to us and said, I don't feel community here. I was nice and, and blessed her as she left. What I really wanted to say was you only show up for 55 minutes on Sunday. Sunday, we can't get you to serve. There's no interaction between you and anybody else. You get here late and you leave early. You don't eat with nobody. You don't go drink coffee with nobody. You're not connected to anybody. And then you wonder why nobody feels like there's any community because you don't have multiple points of contact. Listen, if you're here faithfully every Sunday, I'm glad. I'm thankful for you. But that's only one point of contact with the community of Christ. And if Sunday is your only moment of contact with this body, then it is inevitable when the storm hits your life, you will fall because you won't have any support systems in your life. And so the only way for me to maintain the spiritual height that I gain is this. My life must become intentionally intertwined with not only him, but them. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? I'm glad you come in here and get your spiritual fix. I'm glad you come in here and get the goosebumps that you get. But let me tell you this morning, you have got to intertwine your life not only with God, you've got to intertwine your life with people in this body that you're assigned to, and that will not just take place on Sunday morning. Some of you only connect to God. Some of you are only connected to the body, but it takes both. So this is my challenge to you this morning. I want to challenge you to check your contact points. It cannot be singular in nature. The, mo the more contact, the more ability to cling. And so I need you to ask yourself this question this morning. Is God a once a week thing? Because your duty as a priest is morning, night, and Sunday. In fact, it didn't even give you a day off. There ain't no day off. Morning, night, and Sundays. You need to bookend your days. Every day there should be substantial contact with him. Morning, night. Let's go David's pattern. Morning, noon, and night, because some of y'all leak. Morning, noon, and night. We should be connecting with him, and then we bring our connectedness together on Sundays. But then let me ask you this question. Is your contact with the community only one day a week? Well, I'm just waiting. I'm waiting on somebody to call me. I'm waiting on somebody to reach out to me. I'm waiting somebody to connect with me. You have a duty as, as a priest to intentionally connect with them. Your, your phone works. Ain't nobody called me. Who have you called? Well, nobody wants me to go eat. Who have you invited to go eat? Nobody comes and watches me play ball. Whose ball games have you been to? Contact produces connection. You missed it. One more time and then I'm, I'm done. I'll get out of your way. Contact 
produces connection. You are only as connected to God as you contact Him. Some of y'all would claim really strong connection with God. And when I really dig, there's no contact all week long. This is your connection point. You ain't that close. You ain't that close. Just let a virus roll around. You'll fall off. You're only connected to one another as much as you contact one another. Some of y'all don't ever contact outside the confines of the two minutes that I gave you to greet one another during our service. Father, help us. Father, we don't want to obtain height that we cannot maintain. I pray in this very moment right now, you would do what I cannot do. I've tried to be as challenging as I can without being rude. Holy Spirit, I give you permission to be rude. Shake us at our very core. Let us examine our own life in this moment to discover that many of us are not nearly as connected to you as we think we are. Holy Spirit, spotlight our relationship with you right now. And if we are basing our entire relationship on you, uh, with you on Sundays, I pray that you would convict us in our spirit right now and you would wake us up in the morning and you would wake up us, us up at noon and at night to the fact that we need constant contact, interaction with you. And may we become very intentional about it. May it not be haphazard. May it not be flippant. I pray that we would become disciplined like priests. This is our job. This is the mandate on our life. But Father, I also pray that you would convict us. Holy Spirit, do a work on us right now. Every person in this room. Every person in this room, introvert, extrovert, annoying, that's super extrovert. Spotlight us all. We have a mandate on our life to develop contact points with your community because we need one another. Your word tells us that every joint supplies need, but if the joint's not here, if it's not in relationship, if we're not connected, then there's no way for that to happen. So Father, I pray that you turn the spotlight on us and some of us need to recognize that we're working harder to develop relationships with people that don't even know you than we are with the people that you've assigned to us spiritually. And I pray that we would become intentional about breaking down walls and barriers and we would go out of our way to connect with one another so that we supply life and stability and sustenance to one another so that we don't fall. I pray that you'd help us in this today. May we truthfully and vulnerably examine the condition of our own life in this moment. I pray you do this in Jesus' name. If you're here and you're willing to allow the Holy Spirit to do that, would you just do this with me? Would you just turn your palms up for just a moment as a, as a symbol of surrender? Father, we surrender to you. If we're as connected as we need to be, great. But if we're not, we surrender to you as our Lord, our Savior, our boss, our King. Create a desire in us to know you, to be known by you to seek you in the morning and to seek you at night. To love our moments with you in church, but also to love and to seek moments with you outside of this fellowship. Father, we lift our hands in surrender. Some of us are so isolated. We've become so closed in in life that we've, we've built barriers and walls that keep us from connecting with the people around us and we're not here by chance. You, you, you bring the body together. So Father, I pray that in this moment you would convict us of isolating ourselves and we would go out of our way 
We surrender to that command. It's a choice. It's a job. And I pray that in this moment, we would become more diligent in that pursuit than we have been. And Father, we, as we surrender, we believe you're going to do this in our lives individually and corporately. And because of it, there are going to be people here that can withstand significant blows and it'll never even touch them because their foundation is secure. We ask you to do this in Jesus' name. Come on, touch your neighbor right now and say, I'm going to be connected. Come on, tell him, I'm going to be connected. Alan, would you come here just a minute? This is Alan Ortiz, and um, we honor the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Bible declares that the gifts are still alive and that one of the gifts that he gives us is words of encouragement. I believe this is a word of encouragement. Um, I've asked Alan to read it to us because I don't want you to miss. Um, I think it ties in very well with what I talked about, about the season we're in, that we need to increase our contact points with him. So Alan, would you just share with them, read to them what the Holy Spirit gave to you, and then I'll come back and close this. Uh, I guess you're going to need this unless you're really loud. <laughs> uh, this morning in my devotion time, uh, I asked the Lord if there's anything he would like to say to Passion Church. And he gave me a love letter from him. There's a song in your heart that you must tap into. There's a song in your heart you must pay attention to. Help it. Nurture it, exercise it, grow it. Your heart is full of Jesus. Let it sing his story. Let it give him glory. It's eternal and it's who you are. For all of us, the end isn't far. Our forever home is in, is in heaven, but now is the time to shine, the time to focus, the time to go deep. For this is the time for his glory to manifest. Let your gifts flourish. Let your mind be heaven. No man has ever seen or heard what God has prepared for you as you love him. So chase him. Seek him. Know him like never before. And those that have gone before you had their chance. But... Now it's your turn. What better way to spend yourself than to spend it on him? He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It's time. It's time. It's time. Yeah, man. You say, well, what does that mean? It means come up higher. It means come up higher. But to do that, you have to be connected. I encourage you. I'm getting ready to dismiss you here in just a second. And when I do, you've had an encounter, hopefully, with Jesus. But you also need to connect one another. Because the Hebrew writer says this, spur one another on. How am I going to go higher when you spur me? Anybody else notice that you, you have a tendency to plateau? If you're left to yourselves, I will. Let's be honest. I plateau all day long because I'll go to where it's comfortable and I'll stop. We need to do what Alan's talking about. We need to push one another that this is our time. This is our season. We've got to push one another and you do that as you connect. So this is what I want to It's been a privilege to have you join us for this time of ministry. To find more Passion Church resources or to make a donation online, visit www.passionchurch.tv. Remember, you can't live without passion. 